That feels like a recipe for horse-based disaster. Welcome back to Dead Good Book Reviews, I'm Judith and you're watching the first Animorphs video of 2021. Yes, the series lives, and so do I, mainly motivated by the fact that the book we're discussing today, Animorphs 14 The Unknown, is a Cassie book, and if you've been watching the series to this point, you'll know that Cassie is the best character. I dropped my phone on the floor. It's all fine. In an almost clairvoyant way, every single Animorphs cover has one face on it that really sums up the mood I was in when reading this book. And in this case, it's this one. Just to discuss the tagline, never underestimate the power of a morph, I would add the additional line of, but apparently never bother to test them out beforehand because that would be too much thinking. I won't bore you with the intro because you can just go and watch the rest of the series, that's fine. But we open the story in Cassie's barn, where Rachel is berating Cassie for having jeans that end an inch above her boots. Just come with me. I'm going to the place. They're having lots of sales. I want you to come with me. Are your bingo cards ready? Because we might be going to the mall. Alas, your bingo cards shall remain stampless because Cassie's dad swoops in at the last second. He's not a hawk, he metaphorically swoops in. He needs her to come with him to the outskirts of the grasslands because someone he sensitively calls Crazy Helen has phoned up and said there's a problem with one of the horses. Cassie promises to Rachel that she will go to the moor with her the next day if she comes along too, so they all head off to the drylands. It transpires on the car ride over to the drylands that Crazy Helen does in fact call herself Crazy Helen. She's around about 80, she owns a souvenir shop out in the drylands, and she met Cassie's dad a while back when there was a different problem with one of the wild horses. Crazy Helen, we're still calling her her that within the text of the book, emerges from the airstream in which she lives behind her souvenir shop. Uh, she is described as having uh, grey hair, patched jeans and cowboy boots. She directs them over to a big rowan mare. I'm not a horse girl, I had to look it up. She's acting all funny, like maybe she's been eating the loco weed. It is at this point that we learn that Crazy Helen can't sleep because she is beset by aliens who are reading her mind and sending her messages in the night through her teeth. But since Helen says that they are Martians and as yet we've yet to meet any aliens from any planet within our solar system, I'm gonna say this is just Helen. After bidding farewell to that situation, they go off to find the horse. Rachel spots it first. And then things get weird. As we watched, the horse seemed to be attracted to the telephone. It picked up the receiver with its mouth and let it hang off the hook. And that's when things got strange. The horse lowered its head to the ground, picked up a twig in its lips and seemed to be poking at the telephone keyboard. Am I crazy? Or is that horse trying to make a phone call? This horse isn't any ordinary horse. Like, it could just be a snake bite making this horse act weirdly, but then also... Suddenly, I noticed something happening to the horse's head. Look, I cried. There, crawling its way out of the horse's left ear, was a slug. A large grey slug. So another horse turns up to kind of look at this dying horse that a slug has just come out of the ear of. But the stallion runs away as the yip tries to reach for it. And at that point, Cassie has this kind of deep instinctual moment where she realises that they need to run. Blinding light happens, everything seems to explode, and Cassie hits the dirt. I was on my back. I was indoors. I opened my eyes. Staring down at me was an alien. A pale, ghostly, oval face with two enormous eyes. It looked like a little kid with weak arms and legs. This particular alien, in case you didn't get it from the description, looks a lot like the aliens from Close Encounters of the Third Kind. In fact, it's exactly like one of the aliens from Close Encounters of the Third Kind. It's a cardboard cutout. There are also Star Wars characters here, and a bunch of merchandise saying, Zone 91. They're in Crazy Helen's souvenir shop and Rachel's there to remind Cassie to keep her lips zipped about that weird yik horse. It was the aliens, Crazy Helen interrupted. They have these exploding rocks they spread around here. Boom! Cassie's dad's theory is not that it was a dragon beam, nor that it was aliens, but that they were on the edge of an Air Force facility and there were probably unexploded things everywhere. Helen, however, is adamant that the airbase, Zone 91, is where they are keeping the aliens who are trying to communicate with her and that the Air Force are listening in on all of her thoughts through a microchip in her head. But Cassie's dad says, hey, Helen, we'd better get on the road. Especially since the horse problem is dealt with because there seems to be no trace of the weird telephoning horse. It's exploded. Ha, it's the Martians, Crazy Helen said. It's all the fault of those darned aliens. Rachel and I exchanged a look. We were both having the same thought. It's a very strange world where a person called Crazy Helen is at least partly right. I don't know that she's totally wrong. Do you remember that book where we learnt that dogs were actually part alien? Like, I would believe anything at this point. Crazy Helen could be the one sane person in the world. I will never write off any idea in this series. <laughs> we're back with the Animorphs and Marco and Jake are telling the gals about Zone 91 and describing it as the holy grail for conspiracy nuts. But where, pray tell, are they having this conversation? That's right, they finally went to the mall. After introducing us to everyone again, including Axe in his human form and Tobias in his new powers, hawk, human, hybrid kind of thing, 
they get down to the big question. Why the heck are the Yicks inside horses? The plan as ever seems to be morph, head on out there and have a look. Which to be fair has always meant that plot has turned up before so you know I can see how they would go for that. Jake can't go tomorrow however since it's actually his dad's birthday. Since his brother is more likely to be doing weird Yick cult things Jake figures at least one son should show up for that. So Tobias, Marco and Rachel are on team horse investigation. Sounds like a TV show I would have watched. The next day at school Cassie's wearing her new outfit. She looks amazing. People are suddenly talking to her because teenagers are shallow. Unfortunately, none of them know what her actual name is. Jake earns one good person point from me. When Rachel presses Jake to tell Cassie how good she looks in her new outfit, he replies, of course she looks great. She always does. Alas, Marco spoils this moment by being Marco, but what can we do? Team, let's go have a look at the horses meet in the barn and morph into their bird forms in order to go have a look. I could try and summarise the flight to the drylands, but I think Cassie does it best. Not for the first time I realised my life had gotten weird. I was flying a mile up listening to the thoughts to beat debate between a bald eagle and an osprey over the existence of aliens. Good grief. Good grief indeed. They get to zone 91 and there are horses scattered all the way through the base. Apparently they're just not bothered by the horses being there. Despite the fact that there was a theory that there could be unexploded stuff. That feels like a recipe for horse-based disaster. Before they investigate they need a chance to demorph because they're getting kind of close to that two hour limit. So they're sat lounging about in human slash hawk form to rest for a bit and I don't know why but they've kind of forgotten that they're on an air force base that they shouldn't actually be in. But anyway suddenly there are automatic rifles being pointed at them. Hey wait a minute it's a couple of miles back to the road. How do you get here without shoes? For that matter, there hasn't been a car down that road all day. How did you get here at all? I looked at Rachel. Rachel looked at Marco. Marco put on a big grin and said, it was the Martians, Lieutenant. We were dropped here by aliens. Wonderful things to say to the people pointing guns at you. We meet some Air Force blokes who have guns and so such. But the thing that we really need to focus on here, there was something more familiar that caught my eye. One of the little flyers was for the gardens. The gardens is a big combination amusement park and zoo where my mum is one of the vets. Below the flyer was a sign up sheet bearing a lot of names. Why is this book told us this? Is this going to be plot relevant later? Do people in the Air Force just really love going to the zoo? Because there isn't actually an explanation for why they are there. The Air Force want to phone their parents. Marco and Rachel give the fake names of Mulder and Scully. Cassie can't think of a name and just goes for Cindy Crawford. We have to get out of here fast, Rachel said. I gave him the phone number for Pizza Hut delivery. <laughs> I love Rachel so much. <laughs> So they need to escape from the military base. How on earth are they going to do that? Of course, the answer is they morph small. We're going for cockroaches this time. I don't quite understand this because surely if anywhere is going to have closed circuit television, it's going to be a military base out in the middle of the desert. Would, do they now have footage of children morphing into cockroaches? I just want to know. It's a roach runaway. I'm imagining the Benny Hill theme the whole time. They manage to get outside enough for Tobias to be able to direct them with thought speak. There's a column of vehicles coming towards them. Tobias manages to scoop most of them up to get them out of the way, but he drops Cassie who falls on the concrete and then is run over by one of the vehicles. But it's not just any chain of vehicles. These are tanks. Those with a knowledge of animals will probably know that despite the fact that Cassie doesn't manage to get out of the way of the tanks, she isn't crushed to death because cockroaches are pretty hardy. I was starting to feel like an idiot. I was the one who seemed most concerned about the idea of yeeks in horses, but we'd learned absolutely nothing. How often can that sentence have ever been said? Not not the yeeks in horses bit, that's fairly unique, but the we, we did the plan and we learned absolutely nothing part. Now we're back to watching horses like the original plan was, and one of the horses needs to go to the bathroom and the horse walks behind a bush. A modest horse? I asked smugly. Rachel nodded. Yeah, it does seem just a little bit weird. Yup, these are not normal horses. They are concerned for their privacy. <laughs> horses setting up a VPN. So the plan is obviously to morph horse. The problem is Cassie's family only have one horse and it's pretty distinctive. They can't all be one genetically identical horse. Thankfully, it turns out out of the plot driven blue, Rachel has a hookup at the race course. They can go there and acquire some of that good, good horse DNA. They get there in seagull morph. It's not super relevant. The most relevant thing is they get there, realize they need to demorph in order to acquire horse DNA. And they've got acts with them who will demorph into a giant blue scorpion centaur. They did not think this through. Tobias has to be in hawk form to get that DNA, so for him it's pretty easy. He just demorphs in the stall and then flaps off to go land on a horse. Some men turn up to ask them what on earth they think they're doing in the stall, and obviously the only thing that comes to mind is to tell Axe to keep his weird head down and pretend he's a horse. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, the men are not buying the blue horse idea. Axe, no, I yelled. Fwap, fwap. That's the way it's written. 
who struck with his deadly tail, but not at the men. In less than a half second, he had sliced the overhead railing that framed the stall. He'd sliced right through it in two places. The railing, a chunk of eight by eight lumber, fell directly on the men's heads. Is it murder? They could, they could have died from that. Really could have. They run, hoping to lose the men in the crowds that have turned up to the race course. But Cassie's grabbed and gets separated from the rest of the group. She leaps into a stall to try and escape. The stall has a stallion in it, so to avoid being trampled and calm it down a bit, she acquires his DNA. One of them is still in this barn somewhere, I heard a voice say. Well, if you want to be inconspicuous in a horse barn, what are you going to do? Exactly. I started to morph the horse. Cassie is the one character in the series that I trust to morph a horse with zero preparation, but still, this could go terribly wrong. But so far so good, the horse mind is pretty chill and now it's time for the great escape. There was just no way to be subtle about it. I stuck my big golden head out over the stall door and did what no horse has ever been smart enough to do. I slid the little lock to one side and pushed the stall door open. Cassie, while realising that her horse brain isn't keen on the smell of a particular different horse, and also having people think she is actually a horse and trying to get her intact, realises that the stallion that she has morphed is a horse called Minneapolis Max, who is tipped to win the Kentucky Derby. <laughs> Come on boy, we have a race to run. That was fine with me. I wanted to run. It's time for Cassie and the horse race. Tobias manages to find Cassie, but by that point she is already in the stall ready to race. My jockey yanked my bridle and dug his toe into my side, and the dumb thing was I didn't really know what he wanted me to do. See, I had the instincts of the horse I had morphed, but I did not have the lifetime training of the professional racehorse named Minneapolis Max. Cassie's a little distracted by the fact that her horse brain really does not want to be in this tiny cramped box at the start of the race, so she forgets that she probably shouldn't do that and ends up thought speaking directly to the jockey. Let's just horrify some more people, shall we? The race begins. Cassie is running like a horse. The jockey tries to rein her in a bit and she speaks to him again because the first time clearly was not enough. Forget winning as I told him. The point is not to win. The point is just to run. This jockey will need therapy for sure. That stallion horse she didn't like the smell of earlier is gaining on them. But Cassie's it, sort of cheating in this horse race in that she can suppress the horse instinct to slow down. This is a bad idea you are just a horse. And she wins the race. I think it was the first time in my entire life I'd ever won any kind of athletic contest. Sure, I was a horse, but hey, a victory's a victory. <laughs> It feels like a John Mulaney quote. From this chapter, we jump directly back to the drylands with the others having acquired horse morphs while Cassie was winning the race. So we have no idea how they escaped, but you know, I'm sure it was all fine and normal and no one wondered why there were two horses that were identical. From the air, they spot that group of modest horses walking in a weird line that no horse would ever walk in towards zone 91. There are some non yerk horses with them because horses tend to herd, so their plan is to sneak alongside the yerk horses and hope for the best. I don't know what to tell you, the plan feels foolproof to me. After a quick roll in the dirt to get themselves looking a little bit less like pristine show horses, they go and join the horse controllers and trot right into zone 91. So they're tiptoeing, tip hoofing into zone 91 and the yerk horses start to talk to one another. Thank goodness Axe is there to explain to us that they're speaking Gallard. Gallard is a sort of universal language spoken by different races throughout the galaxy. It's what people speak when they come from different species and don't share the same language. These horses must have been fitted with speech synthesizers. So essentially the yerks have bought things that allow the horses to be able to speak to one another but they've bought really cheap ones so they aren't equipped with like yerk language, they just speak Gallard. So the question really here has been is there actually a spaceship in zone 91 that's being defended by by the Air Force, and is that what the Yerks want to get hold of? But Cassie realises that the Yerk horses smell weirdly of fear. Why would the Yerks be afraid? A safety alarm goes off, the doors to a huge warehouse open, and three Yerk horses just bolt for that warehouse in a kind of desperate last second attempt to get whatever job they're trying to get do done. Get do done. Get done. Done. Our group jumped into the melee of frantic soldiers and madly dancing, rearing, screaming horses, but our group stayed close together and ploughed straight through, straight through and into the most secret place on earth. So they've run into what they will discover is a big secret science warehouse filled with scientists and now also horses. Bathed in the light, high on the pedestal was something not from this planet. It was about eight feet across. The shape was like a cube with the corners rounded off. The entire surface was covered with tubing and painted symbols. At one end was an opening, large enough for a person to walk inside. I could just barely get a glimpse of the inside. It was smooth, a lovely green in colour, with soft lighting. There was some sort of instrumentation on one wall. And the Yerks have no idea what it is. The Yerk horses, no idea. To be fair, neither do the Animorphs. So they're ambling away from the site and Axe says, actually, I probably do know what it is. When suddenly there's a bug fighter swooping down on the horses. I had to resist the urge to run. That was only natural. But what was strange was that once more I smelled fear from the horse controllers. They were scared of that bug fighter. More scared that they'd been in rushing the hangar. Or more likely scared of who was in that bug fighter. Guess who lands and comes out the bug fighter? 
a hawk bajir. Oh, and Vissa Three and his Andalite body, of course. He monologues for a bit, calls them all fools, you know the drill. But since the horse plan didn't work out, it's on to plan B. The horses, while going through, have decided the best people in the facility that they should uh, yearkify in order to get access to whatever's in the warehouse. At this point, Vissa Three notices the other horses, and although the yerk horses say, no, no, it's cool, horses just kind of do that, Vissa Three reckons, better safe than sorry, Better kill the horses just to make sure they aren't Andalite bandits. I felt a thrill of terror. I ordered myself to run away, but I wasn't the only creature in my head right then. Minneapolis Max was in there too, and he didn't feel like running away. My hindquarters bunched up and fired every muscle fibre at once, and before I knew what was happening, I was running, but not running away. I ran straight for the first hawk -bajir. After thwacking the hawk -bajir with her mighty hooves, they run away. Exit, pursued by hawk -bajir. <laughs> They're not sure if they're going to escape, but then some Humvees from Zone 91 turn up, and the Yerks don't want to be found out, so they just stop what they're doing. Now that the danger is passed, it's time to explain what the thing in Zone 91 is. It's a disposable module of a type used in the old days of the first generation of Andalite dome ships. When the modules were used up, they were jettisoned into space. They were supposed to be aimed towards a star, so they'd be burned up without a trace. This one must have drifted through space, eventually being caught by Earth's gravity. So it's a space engine? It's a weapon? No, of course not. It's... well, this is a bit embarrassing. It's an Andalite dome ship's modular waste disposal system. For about a full minute, no one said anything. Then Marco spoke. You're telling me the most secret place on Earth, the fabled Zone 91, the holy grail of conspiracy nuts, is hiding the secret of an Andalite toilet. Whew. I mean, no one was expecting it. Out of horse, into bird, and home again. There's not much danger from the humans having an Andalite toilet. They're not going to work out what it is. They're not going to do anything dangerous with it. So now the biggest problem is Cassie's parents, who are somewhat confused by where she has been this whole time. But in true 90s parent form, they are more concerned that she's spending a lot of time with Jake when she's not allowed to date yet. Having escaped that particular peril, Cassie puts her mind to why on earth the Yerks want an Andalite toilet that badly? Her reckoning is that it's because it is proof that aliens exist, and if they ever release that proof, it will make the idea that there are Yerks in the world even more believable. So the Yerks are relying on the fact that it's ludicrous to expect a slug to infest people's brains. That's so silly. But if there's an Andalite toilet, then that means there could be other aliens, which means there could be slugs in your brain. Uh, in my notes I've written, if the government reveal their space portaloo, all heck will break loose. <laughs> there was a backup plan, that's what the Vissa had said, and I suddenly had a pretty good suspicion what it was. Tomorrow evening at 1900 hours, the gardens would be full of people who worked at Zone 91, just like the sign-up sheet at the base had said. If you go down to the zoo today, you better go in disguise. Cut to the gardens at night, Cassie is an owl morph, checking things out. But there are people in the park before there ought to be. Turns out this is an issue because Cassie cannot read military time. So instead of being there with loads of time to spare, they now only have an hour. Everything's going wrong. So they think it's probably going to either go down on the log ride or in the haunted house. Cassie and Marco flap off to the log ride, but being an owl there is going to be no use, so they morph back to human. Marco says something I honestly don't remember and it can't have been important. What is important is that one of the military guys riding the log ride recognises his voice. Why, that's one of the strange shoeless teenagers who turned up at the military base a while ago. Why is he here? And they try to capture them on the log ride. So they sneak off the log boat and into the kind of darkness of guts of the ride. Cassie falls out of the log and into the water and is kind of dragged along through the mechanism of the ride, which is an actual nightmare I have had. Ah! Over the edge we went. I skidded on my butt down a 50 foot water slide, which was bad enough, but just a few feet behind me were two guys and an angry man. No one likes an angry man. Narrowly escaping a horrible death, they realise, hey, it's probably not going down here, we should go check on the haunted house. It's actually called the House of Horrors. This can only go well. They're riding the House of Horrors and the captain is right behind them, but it's worse than that. See, somehow, whoever had built the ride seemed to have created perfect, life-size replicas of six hawk warriors, and standing behind them, also frozen in place, was a creature with the body of a deer, the tail of a scorpion, and a mouthless face. They were all very lifelike, probably because they were alive, Vissa 3 was in the House of Horrors. Thankfully, also near them is the life-size statue of a grizzly bear and a snake and a bird. It's the other guys! They're there, hidden in morph. In the seconds before everything goes down, Cassie realises that the Yerks are actually going to target the captain because he'll be able to give them access to all of the security systems. She shouts this out loud because she's not in morph, so she can't thought speak it to people. Witnessing her friends in morph trying to stop the Yerks from kidnapping the captain? Man napping? Human adult napping? I don't know. They're trying to capture him. Cassie and Marco sneak off into the shadows to morph into something a bit more powerful. Cassie's morphing Wolf, which is handy because a random onlooker who's just casually riding the House of Horrors 
thinks that she's a werewolf. Jake's a tiger, Mark is a gorilla, we all know the drill at this point. But before they can do anything, Visser 3 slashes his way out of the House of Horrors with the Hawk Bajir and the Captain in tow. So they're running after these aliens, which is already weird enough, but there's a parade happening in the gardens and there's people dressed as cartoon characters everywhere. A vicious battle raged. Rachel and two Hawk Bajir, Jake sinking his tiger fangs into another Hawk Bajir, Marco using Axe's snake morph like a bullwhip, snapping him in to bite, yanking him back out, and Tobias was using all his speed and agility to tear at the Vissa's vulnerable andalite stalk eyes. Yay! A voice yelled. Cool! Another voice cried. <laughs> it's so accurate as to what people would do. <laughs> the crowd is too thick to see where the captain has got to, but Cassie has her wolf nose at her disposal. Wolf Cassie leaps onto one of the Hawk Bajir, which gives the captain a chance to run for his life. The baddies run to their spaceships, which they have incredibly cleverly hidden in the alien spaceship ride. It's probably the smartest thing we've seen them do this whole series. And yeah, everything's fine. The news, as ever, completely misses the fact that it was aliens. The captain has decided that this was an elaborate prank by these teenagers. Those meddling kids, Mulder, Scully and Cindy Crawford. <laughs> the next day they meet up in the barn to ask the truly vital questions. Don't you think, in all fairness, in all decency, in all kindness, we should tell Captain Torelli he's guarding an alien toilet? I shook my head. No, Rachel, that wouldn't be kind at all. He and the others have a meaning to their lives now. Why should we destroy all that and make them feel trivial and foolish? Despite the fact that the Yerks are going to be trying to get the space lavatory anyway, they've decided this is probably fine because the captain is going to be more on guard now. I guess we can just leave that plot thread where it is. Marco's being a wang, but we end on an exceptional moment because Cassie is the best character. That's when I dumped a bucket of water on Marco's head and we all went home. And that's book 14. Thank you so much for joining me on this one. I feel like I've been waiting an extra long time for another Cassie book. So this was exceptionally joyous and a lovely way to start the year. I feel one of the things that I really like about this book is that it kind of emphasizes how epic earth animals are and how great they are. Like a hawk bajur is a creature made of knives that this entire alien race has decided to use to be their killing machines across the galaxy. And a horse is just like, ha ha, I'm a horse. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, let me know in the comments below while you're down there commenting. You can also subscribe. It makes me feel loved and appreciated. Follow me on all of my social media. That's all from me and I will see you in the next one. It's got a piece of bloopers now. When, when Rachel's prologue, Minneapolis Max, just a slightly less amazing Swiftwind. Oh, that was a long one.